Hi, and welcome to the Secret Gallery podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm here with Philip Barish, and today we're going to be interviewing Jill McVarish. Jill is a painter and also the curator of the Secret Gallery. And so take it away, Philip. All right. I'm glad you said painter and curator because we're going to hit on both of those topics. And I want to let you know how I'm excited I, I am to be chatting with you, Jill. We chatted on and off over the last year or so, but to sit down and have a an actual extended conversation is something that I'm I'm very, very excited about. So thank you very much for, for doing this. Well, thanks for talking to me. This is going to be fun. It is. Okay. So here's what I want to start with. I want to start with Astoria. And uh, Astoria is basically the, it's the end of the world. And if the world were flat, this is where we'd be able to see ships sail off the edge. And here you are. So, so how did you come to be in Astoria? What put you here? Well, I moved here in 2006 because I was in Phoenix and this was the year that they were giving home loans to just anybody. And I had a friend who moved out here and she's like, Oh my gosh, you're going to love it. And so I just came out here and it's not just like the end of the world. It's like the old West. It's crazy. It's there's so many like things about this town that are just preserved in time. And it is like you say, just right at the edge of the world. And it's such a nice reprieve from the Bay Area or Phoenix or anywhere that time has sort of slowed down here. And it's a pretty amazing place. Yeah, well, and I also would like to add that uh, there's an enormous amount of energy here. I mean, you and I'll just point out, Chris, the, the proprietors of the Secret Gallery are, are part of a, a really significant kind of cultural energy that's happening here. And uh, I became aware of it when we first started coming out to Astoria, you know, a number of years ago. And it's just, there's no question about it. There's a lot of things in place here that make it not only a unique place to be, but there's just, I don't know, there's something about being at the edge, the literal edge, the figurative edge that just produces all kinds of really interesting stuff. And I would have to say that I, it, to my mind, that I really clearly see your paintings figuring into this idea of being, as you characterized it, the Old West, because pretty much anything can happen out here. There's, there's something to be said about being in a very um, kind of just detached end of the world place. So tell me how you feel about that in terms of, of you actually being a painter. Do you feel disconnected from large kind of urban areas at all? Or do you feel that you're getting to breathe? No, I, I, I don't feel any lack of connection to big urban areas at all. And I, I mean, when you say that Chris and I are sort of like um, – channeling something or I mean this was already here before I got here or Chris got here or anything this is just kind of a magical place and this is kind of a magical time here because this place is sort of a time capsule and there's been a migration of artists toward more rural areas like this coming north a lot um, getting priced out of California moving up to Portland getting priced out of Portland and so this has just become this like amazing vortex of artistic people that like I just happened into or Chris just happened into and we were just kind of lucky to be here and be able to like be a part of it um, and again I think it was just complete luck like I said I'd never been here before I'd moved here and it was just a random bit of chance but wow, wow. you haven't been out here before now. wow that's no amazing. no I moved up here sight unseen and my crazy friend that I moved up here to live or to stay with until I got my house had never even been out here or seen the house she lived in before she bought it on Craigslist so this was just really like I mean it was just a a, a thing of like we couldn't afford to buy a house in California. We couldn't afford to buy a house in Phoenix. We couldn't afford to buy a house in Portland. So you keep going north and it gets more and more remote. And it was just, I mean, really the luck of Craigslist that she got here and I got here. And it's really been pretty random. And it, it wow, it's, I mean, I really lucked out finding this place because, yeah, there's a ton of history in this town. 
Yeah, well, that's a remarkable leap of faith, number one, but I would also argue that there's synchronicity in there. It's no accident that a leap of faith turned into what it has turned into. I just, uh, you know, this is just, this is an amazing place to be. So, so here you are and, and you come from a large family. You came from the Sacramento Valley area. And I just can't help, we'll get into this, feel how much that family shapes what you do with your artwork. And so you're- Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am the ninth of 11 kids and- my father was an artist and he would, had a really diverse set of interests and he was just passionate about everything as we were growing up. So he was fascinated by Celtic music and my little brother's a fiddle player and like he was a painter and I just couldn't get enough of his painting. And so I don't know, we all sort of were somewhat inspired by our dad and then ultimately inspired by each other too. And one of the, few perks of being the ninth kid. But yeah. Well, I would say that of all the artists whose work I've been looking at over the last few years, and just so you know, you first came on my radar when you had a show at Gallery 903 in Portland, Oregon. And of course, that gallery has a beautiful footprint. It's a beautiful big space. And uh, a friend, well, Joseph Blanchett, a dear friend of mine, we went in and there were these curiously, marvelously odd paintings by Jill McBarish. I think the show was um, Bedtime Stories or something like that. And so that's when you first came on to my actual radar as, as a painter. And the first thing I responded to, and I still respond to really profoundly in your work, Jill, is that I get a sense of who you were as a little girl. And what I mean by that is that your work has a very playful, girlish kind of um, genetic component to it. And, and so when I was reading about the fact you came from a large family, it, it it started making sense to me that that somehow you have been able to to maintain and honor who you were as a child through your artwork. And I see it so much because your artwork is whimsical. It's fun. It's playful. It has an enormous fantastical component. So um, just uh, I was very pleased to see that you came from a large art family because it just it 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 made sense. Yeah, I mean, my grandmother was a librarian, and I grew up on all those old illustrations, the um, the Mother Goose, and some of the more recent, like the Marie Sindek and Frog and Toad are friends. And I think that was like, even when I was little, I was really fascinated by illustration and all that stuff, because you could, the, my mom would read our stories, and then you could look at the pictures, and you could just go right into those pictures, and um we didn't have pets as, as kids, and it was like, I don't know, all those animals were like these fantastical kind of characters in an alternate world. And that was just, I mean, just to really simplify it. That's probably just where my initial aesthetic came from. And then, well, you know, you kind of spend your life trying to figure out, like, yeah, what you're going to do and stuff. But that's always there. It's just kind of. When I was the illustrators, so when I look at your, when I was looking at your paintings, since you brought up illustrators, the ones that came to mind immediately to me are people like Arthur Rackham and Edmund Dulock oh, yeah. and, and Kay yeah. Nielsen, you know, the, the golden age of illustration. So that came up immediately to me. But I was also thinking in terms of there seems to be a strong bent in your imagery towards the pre-Raphaelites. You know, I see Rossetti and William Hunt and John Millis and a a lot of Ford Maddox Brown and probably some, you know, Edward Byrne Jones. So I can't help but think that there's also that kind of influence that you, you, you're, there's, there's allegorical stuff in your work, but it goes beyond allegorical because you get into these really interesting kind of states of whimsy. And so I, I would like you to just talk about you know, the whimsical nature of what you do. Well, I think the whimsical nature took a really long time to come back to because once I decided, and it was, you know, a lot later, like I was probably in my teens when I decided, well, I ever want to be a painter. And then I started studying 20th century painting and really looking at painting. And, you know, the more like you look at modernism and all the recent movements and stuff, then there was 
always this compulsion toward, okay, well, completely separate from imagery or what a painting's about, like what makes a beautiful painting. And then, I mean, it, it took me a really long time to come back to this kind of imagery because I think for maybe a dozen or 20 years in between there, it was figuring out painting. And I, when I tried going to school in Europe, the one thing that like really struck out to me was just the power of beautiful old compositions, you know, and that, um, I mean, that's, it's a completely separate thing. And so once I kind of found my subject, I'm certainly most interested when I'm working really in just composing a painting that, that honors that kind of history of painting. So I like all these fun subjects and then at the same time want to make it about paint. Yeah, well, yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because, first of all, let's just acknowledge the fact that you're a very gifted painter. You you know how to manipulate paint. And so when you were in Europe, you would have seen a lot of great masterworks because another thing that I think is very influential in what you do is the importance of the portrait. A lot of your work is portraiture. I mean, albeit you are taking, let's just say, latitude with portraits. But at the very heart of what you're doing in terms of what, you know, formal composition and your manipulation of paint, portraiture, I think, figures very heavily into how you uh, approach what you do. So um, you saw a lot of great masterworks you would have had to have. I did. And most of it was figurative. And I found that I was really, I mean, there's something about the human face and the expressive nature of the human body that just is to me like more compelling and also one of the hardest things to paint. And so I spent a good deal of time doing sort of imagined figures. And it's only been in the last few years that I've actually had to for work to real portraiture, which is a completely different thing. Like I am so in awe of people who render people well, because it's one thing to play with light and shadow and imagine things. And that's sometimes like the fun in some of the more imaginative, like that bedtime stories, you can work from your imagination, but I have to like hats off to people who really understand figure and anatomy so well that they can to a real portrait of a person. Yeah, like um, you're talking John Singer, Singer Sargent type portrait is probably what you're talking about. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I didn't see the real person in person, but I'm pretty sure that he nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of like, so I first saw your bedtime stories. And then when I saw work that came after that, it had moved more into what I would call not just whimsy, but you started getting into a lot of animals that are very heavily anthropomorphized. I mean, they're, they're distinct characters. And so when I was talking earlier about how I was responding to your work and kind of seeing the little girl in you, one of the things that I felt is that you had the, all of these characters that you could then like dress up and have them go off and play in your paintings as other characters. So there was these levels of, I don't want to really say meaning to me, these levels of function, like a little rabbit with a blowtorch or, you know, little dog sitting in front of teapots or whatever it was that, that they, these were essentially like aspects of your personality that were distinct characters that you then, dressed up to become other characters that you set them on these stages and they got to got got to play around so the work that i started seeing after the 903 show and particularly the work i've been seeing here in astoria to me really speaks to your ability to reach in and find the little all these little kids and just dress them up and let them play i mean is that is that am i am i close on that you're dead on on that and it 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 has a lot to do with like finally finding what I enjoy doing because for about a dozen years, I um, finally found a job doing painting for an art distributing company. And I didn't have any choice whatsoever about what to paint. They would just tell me like, we want a pretty lady and like this kind of style and yellow and it needs to be this big or whatever. And I think like, the years after I got out of school, I was, I was pretty overwhelmed about like 
what do you paint? Like what's relevant? What makes a good painting? All these questions. And then I got the opportunity to spend a whole bunch of years not having a choice at all about what to paint. And so when I finally stopped doing that work, it was like, I didn't care anymore. It was really like, I could pull out like all my toys and just dress them up. And I wasn't like concerned in any way about like any more, like just the content just wrote itself. It was, it was, it was playtime finally. Like, and it was part of that, like not being able to play with subject matter and, and really seeing it as a more, you know, an occupation or, um, a, you know, a, a technical pursuit. And then I guess like having not had fun with it for so long, like as soon as I got to do it, it was, I, I just couldn't stop. Like I, I have more ideas than I do time to paint them because what if you could have fun painting and if you could, you know, wouldn't it be funny if you put this there or something, you know? Yeah. Well, you are having fun. I mean, another thing I find really interesting about your work is that um, it, 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 because there's this component of like the child inside of it, that your work comes right up to being macabre, but it stops. And so it, 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 for me, it stops because you're telling the little kids, you know, whether it's a little bear or whether it's a rabbit or whatever it is, you're telling them, you can go out and have fun and you can play, but you have to be nice. You can't be mean spirited. You can't be nasty. So when I say that it comes up to being macabre, what I, what, what I mean by that is when I think of like, you know, we think of the great cartoonists like Charles Adams or Gay and Wilson, you know, even Edward Gorey, um, is that you, you let your kids play, but they all have to play well together. They have to, they have to have fun and be respectful and be courteous. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that's embedded in there that, that, that I think doesn't allow you to get into a really dark, nasty place because it's not, it it just, it wouldn't work. And so I don't know, am, am I close on that one? No, you're completely accurate on that one. And I think there's been like a lot of, um, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, uh, like a fascination with the darker, the more macabre. And I, I, I just don't identify with it at all. I mean, part of what I love it about like Rackham's illustrations is like, or like we were talking about Peter and the wolf recently. Like it's that invitation to go into something different and at the same time, like not have to have it like, leak blood out of its eyes and have big teeth and stuff like that. What if it was like an identifiable adventure where you could look at it and it wouldn't, wouldn't be threatening. I mean, what, I I don't know. That's just the way, I mean, I think I like to see things happen. I don't, I don't want to look at a painting and be like, Oh, I'm so scared or Ooh, how shiny blood. I don't know. It's really dark and heavy. (laughs) It's like, Wow. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. Well, because even the stuff and scale comes into play too, but even the things like, you know, their paintings, the, the three graces and the, the sock monkey in, in France, right? And and I guess baptism maybe to a lesser degree, but anyway, so you have these prostitutes sitting around and the very nature of prostitution is that it would imply that it's dark and heavy, but then here's this little like sock monkey. And then, you know, I look at the prostitutes and there's not, there. it's not like the sense that they're like the women of the night, like they're the car girls and they're, they're in the, in the bordello. I mean, there's just, there's something underneath all of that, that as, as if it's all just a stage like you've all just put it out on a stage yeah, in all of their costumes i like to play with those like combinations of things like the um the baptism one was a murder scene but i wanted it to be like the prettiest like nicest kind of a murder scene you could envision so if you take like one concept and then make it so pretty and nice that it's compelling that it's like, wow, I'm really liking looking at that murder scene. I I really enjoy like combining those two things, you know, like, um, a lot of like the, um, the, the postcard with the collector is like this adorable little possum and he's going out for, you know, he's got his picnic basket and it's like all the critters he's killed that day for dinner, you know, and it's, but it's adorable. And I, I really like to play between those two 
yeah, yeah, it's a murder, but it's oh, it's awful cute, you know, like I don't know, like that kind of combination combining of things to make it into something that kind of bounces you two ways. Well, I would also add that your, you know, costumes, your sets, I mean, that all of these things, you have all of these trappings that also come into play and they're really fun to look at. I mean, they're very ornate or not ornate. There's, you know, you have lots of really cool kind of Victorian furniture and you have lots of cool of these really like all of these costumes that have all of these textures and all of these colors. So I don't know, it's just, it's just, it's like dress up and it's just, it's just so much fun because I just feel at the end of it, at the end of the gig, so to speak, that everyone goes away and they all had a really good time. Yeah. Nobody got hurt. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that's, and then that's where just like my interest in, um, you know, color and paint kind of meet fun with narrative. Okay. So to painting. So you went to the San Francisco Art Institute and then you went off to Europe. And, and so tell me in terms of your technique, where, and you obviously had been painting prior to that, where would you say falls the, the most important phase of how you developed technically? Probably really the most important important phase was when I was a kid and I learned drawing and color theory and painting from my dad. The most inspiring was, I would say, my experience in Amsterdam and going to the Rijksmuseum and seeing the Dutch masters and looking at Rembrandt's in person. That was like, I could, there's just no way to describe that except just I don't know, like mystical. It, it 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 kind of kind of set my interest on fire in terms of like what's possible and like what I like and what I want to do. Um, but there were, you know, there there have been a lot of things. Like I think the most amazing paint instruction I got was at College of Marin in Marin County. Like there are some, there were some really amazing teachers there. Chester Arnold, um, Troon. Bickle, I think was his name. And, and, and there was probably where I got some of the best paint instruction. So that, I mean, I think that was significant too. And then at the Art Institute, just the energy and the, the um, kind of imagination of fellow students that I was around. So, I mean, there've been several different things that kind of influenced me at different periods. Okay. Cause yeah, cause painting just, Painting. So, so I'm going to tell you. So, I went to your show at River Sea here in Astoria a number of months back, and and that show to me was a little bit confounding. I went back to it multiple times, and having seen your work for the last few years, that particular body of work is um, it. You broadsided me, and 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 I'll tell you why. First of all, the images themselves are all ovals. And the frames were really essential to the piece. I mean, there are some paintings with a frame, you just have to have a frame and a collector or someone else is probably going to swap it out anyway. But that particular body of work, I felt that the, the, the frame, the oval frames was so integrated with the image that they were inseparable. So it already was removed from anything else I had seen by you before. And it would also would imply you know, a Victorian sense of things. It implied like, a, you know, a brooch or an amulet or some kind of uh, Victorian trapping. And the works themselves, in terms of their actual kind of construct, their composition, were, were very highly um, portraiture. You know, I mean, even though they were they were animals, it was, I think it, one of them was animal husbandry and Mary and the unicorn. Um, the bears was another one. But what really broadsided me, Jill, was that I felt your ideas about painting in that body of work were eclipsing your ideas about the imagery. And so I had to go back multiple times to understand, to look at the work and see what was going on there. I would also say that that your ideas about painting in terms of how I've seen your stuff in that particular body of work, that there was kind of a restlessness to that. Um, so can you talk about just that, that particular body of work? Yeah, I can. Um, that I'm not terrifically happy with that body of work, but what happened with that one was that over – 
the last year or so, I'd become just increasingly fascinated with the kind of the um, format of the Madonna painting and how you can play back and forth with the Madonna and child. And I'd been doing it all year. I'd been doing um, Pinocchio and uh, Mary and I done just several a, a possum family and like I kept coming back to that Madonna image so when Dave and I decided to do this um natural history museum I imagined this whole wing in this natural history museum that would be all these sort of odd combinations of Madonna and child but more in a freakish this doesn't usually occur in nature thing but I think what happened, and I don't think you're wrong about the restlessness, was that that oval format is pretty tricky, and I'm not really used to it. So I found myself wanting to make much bigger paintings within the kind of small and constrained oval format. So what came out were these kind of strange Madonna paintings in these Victorian sort of colors and shapes that were trying to be bigger paintings, probably trying to be okay because because I, because it's not it what for me it wasn't just that they were kind of odd to me more than any other paintings I'd seen of yours that that body of work that the imagery was really kind of like moving up through the 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 actual layers of the paint itself and so there was very much this sense to me as if you'd been like you know chipping away at something and you know you were the the outer edges of it were rough and the inner edges as you got further and further in became more refined and so the outer edges is what i really studied in those paintings is where the ideas were really about paint and then as you moved into the composition, into the center of the oval, it became about the ideas of image. But I was more interested in your application of paint because it, it just felt to me like you weren't concerned about having to make something representational. What you were concerned with was your relationship with paint with within the oval. And you're right, the ovals were weird too. I mean, and, and I don't think that you could remove those frames. I think that, that those things have to, to be kept as, as singular artifacts. Yeah, and, and I mean, what you point out about like them sort of starting from the middle was sort of what I was fascinated with um, for this whole year with the, with the Madonna painting. Was it, it was the gaze between the mother and the child and and then like what if the mother had this really loving gaze and then the child was some horrific plastic baby Ronald McDonald maybe you could still do that same thing where you could capture that loving gaze and so most of what was going on in any of those pieces was was trying to just capture that really intimate moment between those two close characters and then it just kind of spread out from there like that was where the attention was supposed to be which is kind of often why I think that kind of image is depicted in an oval, but it's not a way that I'm used to working either. I mean, okay. in an oval, you really have to like hone down your, um, like a single point of focus because you can't really spread it around like you can a rectangle. Is, it, well, is that something you would do again? Would you think of a, a shape other than a square or a rectangle? Although most of your work is predominantly rectangular. I mean, that's, yeah, the more I work on circles and squares, I, the more I like rectangles. And um, yeah, not so much with the ovals and the circles. Even squares are difficult. I, I kind of get the golden rectangle more and more all the time. The golden rectangle, oh yes. Yeah, they call it golden for a reason. <laughs> we love golden rectangles. <laughs> if a rectangle yeah. anything, it needs to be golden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, the body of work you're working on now, let's, uh, I, I'm dying to know how that's going. So let's uh, let everyone know. And I'm, I'm assuming this is still the case that you're doing animals and they are going to be playing instruments as if they were in an orchestra. Am I, are we, is that still tracking? It's still tracking, but it's still evolving as well. Um, it's starting to feel like I'm working less and less on themes recently and sort of taking pieces, one piece to another. Um, 
so maybe what it, it initially started with the idea of Peter and the wolf and um I I was going to follow the story exactly about you know this is the oboe and this is you know this is the wolf and this is grandpa and stuff like that but then realized there was a lot more possibility in like assigning a, a room that would be a whole symphony and like you would consider which which instrument this this animal would play and it started of course with the cowbell and a cow and the more I do it, it seems to be more like I'm starting to do horses dancing and it may become a little bit broader. Um, I'm not sure yet. I'm, I'm still seeing where it goes. I, I feel like I'm getting more away from the idea of themes and just letting one piece kind of dictate what the next piece will be. Interesting. Which is kind of different. I haven't worked that way. Well, yeah, and that, something time. I would like to point out, too, is in terms of this would seem to me to be a, a very natural kind of like extension of what you've been doing, because you, know, you have all these kids or these animals and they're in these costumes and they're on these stages or on these sets, they're doing these things. But I think when as I've been talking to you about the body of work you're currently doing, that more than anything now, you you with this body anyway, are becoming like a, a director or a, a conductor, that you have all of these elements that are highly individual and they are all singular, but then collectively they combined to make some cumulative thing. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just seems to me this is a very natural um, development for you in terms of at least what I've seen. And I was, you know, I got really excited when we started talking about this a couple of months ago, because there's just so many opportunities for you to do what you do, but more really as really as a conductor. I mean, I mean, really, and I don't know if that's your intent. Well, it's interesting you say that because, I mean, since I started working on my own, I've, I've been really focused on shows because I love taking a theme and then sort of composing a whole show together and thinking about how each piece would interact with the other to make a room full of pieces that all sort of spoke together on a theme. And it's not too different from what I'm doing now, but another thing that occurs to me is it's also what I've discovered that I really love about curating and introducing, even if it's not my own work, like seeing how pieces interact in a room. And I think that's something that's kind of also satisfied that same kind of fun that I have in comp putting my own shows together is like, this is sort of the fun in it for me instead of going from like one piece goes over here and one piece goes over there, like thinking of, of it as theater or a whole like walk-in sort of experience where there's more than one piece bouncing yeah. against each other. And yeah. Well, like if you're, you know, and what I was thinking of is if you're sitting in, if you're an audience member and you're sitting in, some theater and you're seeing the dancers or performers up on the stage, in this case, your paintings, and more specifically, when your show comes up, the paintings of all of these animals with their various instruments, and you have the opportunity to understand that they're all having a conversation together. But then you can look at each one and understand how it is a, a part of a sum, that they all come together cumulatively to make a, a, a another effect. And so I just, I don't know, I just, that's something else that in terms of, of having looked at your work that I feel real strongly about, that there's a cumulative effect of these pieces. Well, one of my just all time heroes is Caravaggio because Caravaggio wasn't just a painter. He was a cinematographer. Like he understood things about like just composing scenes and and having like his paintings would have an effect on the room he was in and that like he would direct the light, he would direct the scale, he would do everything to, it wasn't just about like getting up at a painting and, and kind of seeing the paint and seeming, seeing the, the image, whether it's narrative or whatever, he was actually making theater in a room. And that was like, I mean, I, the guy is amazing in that way. And like, if you can do it on a small scale with a show or I mean, try anyway, it's, it's an interesting way to look at how paintings interact 
yeah. outside of themselves or with their surroundings. Yeah. Well, when you were saying that you, so when you finish one of the pieces in this next body of work, you're going to see how that piece then is responding to or having a conversation with the pieces that came prior to that. So let me ask you this. Do you have a specific number of pieces that you're working on for this? I mean, is it, or are you going to, I mean, is it going to continue, will you add to it or, or do you know how many characters are involved in this next body? Um, generally 12 is what I shoot for with a show. It, the way these pieces are going, because I, they're, they're almost like so far the ones I'm doing are all in the same scene and they're coming out pretty big. So it might be a woman playing a cello on the beach and then the, the, painting next to it is the same beach where the horses are dancing at the music or something. So they're coming out kind of big. So I think it's going to be a large scale show, but I'm, I'm shooting for 12. I mean, I think 12 is a good number of pieces to have, but it's, you know, it's somewhat dictated by how big the pieces are. And, and so are they, are they vertically oriented or are they horizontal? I mean, or, or, or is it mixed up? So far, all the pieces are 48 inches high, and that's kind of the – and I'm trying to keep them pretty close, as close as I can within that to life-sized. Um, so, yeah, maybe the one consistent will be that each piece is 48 inches tall. Um, the first one I did was only 24 inches wide, so it was quite narrow and tall, and now I'm doing 48-inch squares. But I think everything will sort of – be close to that same size range, even that very same height. Yeah. Okay. And then you were saying they're on a beach. So is is the background going to be uniform through all of them? No, no, not at all. I mean, with this one, I don't even know what the fourth painting is going to be like. I'm just letting one painting lead into the other and probably straying further and further away from the initial idea of the Peter and Wolf. And then, and then it was going to be specifically a symphony, but now it's just more animals interacting with music. Probably. I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's the loosest kind of concept I've had so far for a show. To wow. Be honest. Okay. Cause well, here's how I'm going to go with the question. I might as well just, you know, bring the question to its conclusion is that if, if the background was not uniform in terms of when you're ready for an exhibition, it will be a, a chronological hanging of the show or is it going to be mix and match? Is it going to matter in terms of chronology where one piece is placed or do you determine that? No, when you get ready no. To limit? No, definitely just do all the pieces and then figure it out. Like and then um, figure it out. Wow. Yeah, yeah, certainly it's I mean, they all sort of will tell you in the end how for me, like how they're gonna interact and that I I really have no idea how that's gonna look. Okay, so right. Of, so this is part of the surprise. Okay, so even though you are the director, you don't know how your cast is going to be assembled for the exhibition. No. <laughs> no, exactly. Wow, that is really interesting. So you could have some of them running amok then, right? It's like... Oh, uh, yeah, no, who knows? Yeah, who needs to be in what corner? Right? And, yeah. <laughs> wow, that is so interesting. So when what when is the show? When, what, are you, what, what are we looking at in terms of when you will have this show? Um, the show is going to be January, February. We've, um, with everything going on right now, we've kind of changed our schedule around a bit. Um, but January, February, Secret oh, Gallery. Man, killer. So you got lots of time. Oh, that is great. I know. I know. That's I know. Really this is why. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boy, that's a really nice, that's, that's a nice timeline right there. Yeah. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very excited about that. Okay. So, um, you brought it up earlier, so let's talk about this too in terms of a curatorial voice. Another thing I would say that um, when I was came out here about two years ago or when you had the gallery on the front end, we'll talk about the secret gallery in a minute, but it was on the front end. The, the thing that was really absolutely dynamic about that space was your curatorial voice. And so I want to talk to you about how you assemble your stable because you have very distinctive things you're looking for and how effective you are at that. 
Well, I didn't start with any kind of curatorial voice. I just really fell in love with that room. Like I had absolutely no plans to open a gallery at all. Like I have worked, I worked at the River Sea for quite a few years and really enjoyed it. And it was really interesting to meet Janine and see how well she she does it. I mean, it, it was sort of mind blowing to realize every everything because as an artist you look at the other side of it you know and you're like well why why is the gallery doing that or how do they do that or why don't they do that but like to see it from the inside and how a gallery works is just amazing um but when i saw the space i really only planned to open it as a studio i just realized that i didn't have the work or the means to do it on my own so i started inviting friends to show and that kind of turned into a once a month thing. And if I started out with a curatorial voice, it was probably just that I got really lucky and the friends that I've known over the years and liked their work. And, and I mean, how cool to be able to show your friends. And the longer I do it, I'm just lucky to meet amazing people. And it's, I don't know. I don't, I don't consider myself like an art connoisseur. I just, I'm like one of those. I know what I like. Yeah, well, <laughs> That's you about it. You know what you like. Yeah. Well, I would just say that the, you know the work you that that the space is amazing. I mean, the work that you show is amazing. It's like I say, it's it's singular. It's 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 unique. It's uh, um, you know, and you were saying earlier that you know you and Chris are you know you you mm-hmm. came into something that was already happening, and I'm I'm certainly I I wouldn't want to like not acknowledge that, that there's a lot of things that have been happening in Astoria for a long time, because that's what it takes to get to where it is. But what I was making reference to is that you and Chris are now major contributors to what has been kind of percolating and going on. And the secret gallery is, is, you know, it's a major player in terms of the energy that's being kind of generated here. Oh, yeah. We offer something completely different to Astoria because we're not really drawing. I mean, there's something you'll find in a lot of galleries everywhere, but especially on the coast and in any sort of area is that generally what you're going to find in, especially in a town where it's heavy with tourism, is regional art. And we're one of the first galleries that are not showing regional art. I'm showing people that like are friends of friends or people I'm often not from here. So we're more drawing on um, work from outside the community and bringing in new and different things than what you have seen here traditionally. And it's, it's a little bit different. There's not, we have like a pretty specific it's it's more narrative painting it's more realism probably even more figurative narrative and it's so it's it's pretty specific and there there hasn't been a gallery like this or a gallery that's not really focused on regional art so yeah we're lucky in that this place has an amazing art community to draw from and just a lot of attention and enthusiasm around art that supports art. And so, yeah, we just found the right place at the right time. Yeah. Well, in the physical space, I mean, it's another thing too, is that there are so many things built into the space itself that make it utterly unique. I mean, the fact that you have to kind of seek it out and, you know, when you get in there and see the actual, you know, the the footprint of the space And, you know, how you've configured, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into what I would call the nuts and bolts. The infrastructure of the space is as important as what's being exhibited in that space. So there's a, there's a combination of a lot of things that come together that help to generate that energy. So, um, tell me about when you first saw the space. Well, that's what I was going to say is there is something magical about this building. This building has been really 20% occupied, like nearly vacant for at least a dozen years that I've been here. It was owned by this renowned art collector, Michael Foster, who was just getting on in years, but had really been working really hard to preserve the old Astoria feel of it. And even like adding 
kind of old town storefronts in the inside area of it, but had really left the building untouched. And that was what I fell in love with about the initial space was it was just yellow pine floors and white walls. And it was just the cleanest, sunniest room series of rooms you've ever seen. And that was how I was just, I mean, I had no business taking it as, as a studio, but it was like the most beautiful untouched space I'd ever seen. And it, it, it remains that way, but then like getting to know this building and then coming back and seeing the room that we now have as a secret gallery was the craziest thing. It was the first time I saw it, the fire department was here because they were doing a walkthrough where they needed to know about all the unopened you know, sort of rooms and places downtown. Potentially and, scary places, yes. Yeah, so they were doing this walkthrough, and I knew about this room, and I was like, oh, my God, can I come in like, and just have a look? And they're like, well, sure, we're going to unlock it now. And there were no lights in here. The, the whole – the building's over 100 years old, and the room has never been – built up so it was just a raw room like the yeah, original it's it an original room floors. yeah yeah like completely on it was like looking at a time capsule and then i mean no lights or anything we just we looked at it with flashlights and it was seriously you had walked into yeah it's it, it was like spelunking but like you'd walk back a hundred years or something and so i mean just little things like getting light in here and then it's always had this sort of like back secret cave kind of feel about it. it it's, I mean, the room itself was it, just incredibly compelling. Yeah. Well, and I would say one of the things is when, when you walk into that space, you can kind you can feel like the energy of the bones, you know, cause that's really mm-hmm. what it is. You're inside a skeleton, but it's not a, it's not a dead skeleton. It's a skeleton that's, you know, muscle and tissue is now starting to be built on top of it. So that's one of the things that I definitely can feel in that space is like I'm in breathing bones and it's mm-hmm. just you know, it's such a fabulous feeling. Yeah, this is a really cool building and this is really an interesting block here on 10th Street in Astoria too because it's you know it's one of the oldest blocks and it was one of the first projects many years ago when they tried to make it into an arts district and they really tried to keep this sort of old town feel but then it's always been sort of abandoned because it's outside of the main part of town so there's this kind of run down artsy abandoned river walk feel to this whole street and when i got here it was just it was completely deserted except for the transit center across the street and there's just yeah it's like you're just walking in and opening up a little bit of history without it's i don't know i just keep thinking of it it's just like it's got this old west feel even the facade of the secret gallery is like an old west schoolhouse it's yeah, it's well, the- like you were saying, is so it had a genetic predisposition in terms of you had an art collector in the front space. So there were probably artists at some time throughout the entire time it's existed have been in and out of that space for whatever reason. And then you have it was this, incredible. Yeah, his room, know, this, this bohemian. His- I mean, there's this bohemian thing that's also embedded in the room itself. Boy, if ghosts existed, really, there was something magical about that room. And there were like Chagall's in there. There were Picasso's in there. And it, the exhibit never changed. It was the same exhibit, but there was so much like just really incredible historical paintings just sitting there year after year. Yeah, but so don't you think room- – I mean, you, you say ghosts, but but don't you think that the energy of the paintings themselves, that that energy... Well, did, yeah, on, I know, did, I'm not talking about like ectoplasm at all. No, just the, yeah. the vibe in that room. Of, but yeah. the energy, I mean, because like, you know, as a painter yourself, you know, you're injecting and investing your energy into the surface. And so that when that painting goes off to wherever it heads, that that energy, you know, it's a living thing. And it's, you know, it's funny because Jill, it's one of the things that's so important for people to do is to go out and actually look at real art, to understand it as a, as living things. And so, um, you yeah, know, and it's really hard to, 
Sorry, it's just it's it's really hard to define that energy, and it, it um I know it sounds weird every time I describe it. That's one of the reasons the Rijks Museum was so amazing to me. Or certain pieces of art just will floor you, and you don't know why until you see them in person. You know, and um I I worry that you know I hope that that continues to be something that people appreciate. Yeah, well, particularly now because all the institutions, all the galleries, all the everything are closed. I think that I think that that's an important thing for people to really understand is that when you don't have access to this stuff, how much it really matters. You know, once we come through the thing we're in now, when we come out the other side of it, you know, the art world should be in a very interesting place in terms of people now understanding why art matters. And I just, I just can't help but believe that. I do too. And I think there's just something physical, you can call it an energy or whatever, but certain artwork just emanates something that you just can't see in a picture. And that's kind of the magic of a room or a piece in person or something like that. So how, how long were you in Europe? I went there in two stints, a total about a year. I was only there for six months for school, and then I went back for actually less than six months, probably five months for summer. And turns out it's a little hard to get a job there. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> a day job. <laughs> yeah, tricky when everybody wants a day job. Yeah. You so, i got to ask you yeah. that. A specific artist, because it's one that I have, haven't heard or thought about in a while, but whose work I absolutely love, is Odd Nerdrum. And so you, oh, must have, you must have seen a fair amount of his work. Oh, man. I remember being introduced to his work when I was at the Art Institute in, like, I want to say, like, 94 or something. Yeah, he was my all-time hero for several years there. I just wanted to be Odd Nerdrum when I grew up. Like, yeah. Wow, talk about like modern day Rembrandt. Just what I heard he paints with his fingers. I mean, it looks like a lot of knife work, but when I heard that about his fingers too, I mean, that guy can do things with texture. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Just, his stuff is really amazing. And so well, I mean, one of the things I noticed in your work is I couldn't help but think, I'm just going to say influence in the best possible way, but or maybe just references or echoes of Nerdrum in, in, in particular, I just, it, it, it's felt just, that. just worship, I just worship his, <laughs> you know, technique a little bit. That That's all. Well, you're worshiping really but, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then another one too, which no, you actually yeah. mentioned and I, and I thought was really funny was Ralph Stedman, you know, that, that Ralph Stedman in the same kind of sentence with odd Nerdrum is, you know, that's, that, that, that's a really interesting juxtaposition. So, you know, Ralph Stedman, He's because, great. And he, he's energy. I mean, it's what he's just, you know, he's radical energy. And so um, he is. And he's another one who really will take the perverse and just like take it all the way out, but still like give you a composition that you can't stop enjoying, you know? Or did you ever read his um, I Leonardo book? He, no. he did a whole illust. Oh my God, it's so funny. He did this whole illustrated autobiography of Leonardo da Vinci. But it's all sort of hilarious, like Ralph Steadman's take on it, where he he completely references old drawing in his work. You know, I mean, a lot of it really does have this sort of, you know, sort of Da Vinci like line quality. But then it's just spitting and <laughs> throwing yeah. things, and you know, it's just fantastic. Yeah, because on the same note, the one that I read was his his take on Sigmund Freud. Which is oh, I mean, it is radical. I mean, it is so radical. Where he's actually taking texts of Freud's and then doing his Ralph Steadman kind of, you know, I will say shtick, but I mean that in a very respectful way. And it is absolutely radical. It, and that's another great thing is where you can you can combine humor and like the most lighthearted. I just love that combination of like. Just humor, sarcasm, all of it, and then combine it with something really heavy and like, you know, know, when you combine those two things or any couple of opposing things and bring them together, it's just, it it makes something like, just, that's my favorite thing. Like, so huge Ralph Steadman fan. 
Yeah, well, and I would say in your work that, you know, one of the things you're effective at is that, like you say, combining human with humor with something that's really kind of dark, like, you know, an image of yours that's my favorite, and it's actually on your on your business card, is is the there's the the bunny with the carrot cake, you know, which is a really funny image. But at the same time, it's like there's there's levels of stuff that are happening there. There's another one with the bunny with the blowtorch, right? And it's just like when you think yeah. of the absurdity of it and the potential for violence, the potential for really horrible things to happen. But at the same time, it's like I don't I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's it's the idea that it could happen and the absurdity of maybe it could happen. But we all really kind of know that it isn't like tongue in cheek. So. Yeah, it's one of the things I really appreciate about your work is that you take, I mean, you, they're pretty serious themes and particularly your allegorical stuff. And you kind of like say, well, let's make it fun. Let's let's not take it too far, too dark, too heavy. Let's not be, you know, Goya. Let's get to a point and stop. Right. Let's, like, like, let's not eat any baby's heads off or right, anything. Exactly. But- <laughs> we don't need to do that. <laughs> We don't need to have the French well, that was like how the, in the trees. Exactly. Like, oh, well, that was how the bunny evolved was like, the bunny is adorable. Like, and everybody loves carrot cake, but what if he was a bad bunny and he was stealing the carrot cake and then the bunny just got worse and worse from there. Like then he became a violent painter and pretty soon he had a blowtorch and like, it was just like, oh gosh, what's the bunny up to now? But it wasn't, you know, the bunny can do anything cause he's adorable. You know, he's not, He's yeah, funny, and he's, so. yeah but he's running amok, but at the same time, he, you <laughs> as the director and he or she as, you know, the actor is you're still in control of the bunny. I mean, it, it, you know, you know when the bunny needs to to stop. That's the sense that I get. <laughs> oh, I just feel like the bunny's relatable. Like, to what extent can I relate to the bunny? Like, I mean... And in every one of those cases, I totally can, even with the blowtorch, you know, he's like, you see him, you see the glint in his eye, you know, you can identify with it. And it's like, how far can you take, how far can you identify with the character kind of like, yeah, we've all been a pyromaniac once, maybe, you know. (laughs) <laughs> right. So, um, can you, are, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about the commission you were doing of the family? I don't, are you comfortable with that? And we can oh, sure. Let, let I mean, the listeners know what, we what can always edit this out later. If that's, <laughs> it was just, uh, it was, yeah, it was it, just a big job. <laughs> Chris, you want to take over here then? I just, I, I mean, if you don't want to talk about it, Jill, but I, I'd certainly like to hear what you have to say. I don't know. It's, it's, it's totally interesting. Um, you know, Jill gets some really interesting commissions and, uh, people will ask her, will ask her to paint all kinds of things. Um, and you know, occasionally she Mm -hmm. says yes. And, uh, this is one in which they, they asked her to paint, uh, their family as characters from horror, from horror films. Mm -hmm. And, we can totally leave this out of the edited podcast later on, but I think it was, it was interesting because it was kind of, uh, it was challenging for you. Well, this is the thing. This is, this is why, like, this is where I've started to really have appreciation for portraiture and these, these kinds of commissions aren't like, Oh, I'll paint a cute bunny and have it do this or that. It was here. You have this, tall, dark, and handsome family, and they all want to be painted as, like, short little Chucky with the red hair and Annabelle, the creepy little squat doll with the big eyes. And this beautiful mother wanted to be painted as Freddy Krueger. And and the dad, who's, like, the nicest guy ever, wanted to be painted as Jason. So this these kinds of things just become, like, a complete exercise in, I don't know, just – like drawing and aesthetic and there's no it's I mean it, it, it it's just an exercise and like how do you do it sort of, well, a have they, kind of thing. have they collectively as a family decided on those images together or did they independently say <laughs> I don't want to be there? well this is kind of funny okay this is kind of funny because the story was that they'd all chosen these things until it was done and then dad's like hee hee none of them knew it <laughs> 
<laughs> but the family loved it. I think they had run the idea past once before, but um, it also came as kind of a surprise, and I was even more surprised to learn that they liked it. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And what, so what, but, you, what you would have learned is that you had to be very disciplined in terms of now having to you know, do a very specific kind of imagery in order to meet a commission. So that. Yeah, how, and there's something that? with portraiture that I've discovered in the, the years I've done, com, com, uh, sorry, portraiture, it, commission portraiture, it's been an extremely challenging thing because not only do you have to represent the person accurately you need to flatter them and that's you know that's where it's really easy to paint a pretty lady or a cute animal or whatever because you're not having to make that particular person in a good light or that particular animal in a good light you can just pretty much make what whatever so then in in more recent portraiture work i've really had to think about well yeah, they look that way, but they probably want to look this way or, or some something or other. And then this final piece was like, oh, my gosh, mom's gorgeous. How how do I make her Freddy Krueger? You know, it was like all of a sudden I was just like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to do it. You know, so it's just there's something about commission work where you don't get to choose what you're doing that really will test your skills. Yeah, well, I guess and probably that's a good thing. I mean, that's then you then you find out exactly how skilled you are. I mean that that you know that because now you've just basically boiled it down to you have your skills at service to a very specific thing, and that's really the nature of it. Yeah, and I've discovered that like my skills at service when it comes to things that hard take a lot longer than like, <laughs> a painting like that would have taken me a month. I think that one took me like three months. I just it struggled, you know, but but then things like that are also more of a surprise when they're done. Like, it's, yeah, I well, don't know what it's going to look like. That you, you wouldn't have learned any other way. I mean, it's, you know, the thing is when you're challenged in a way that is, is either uncomfortable or something you would not normally have sought out, that the rewards are going to be higher in terms of whatever it is you, you take away from that. I mean, don't, don't you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. And um, uh, that's why I'm not sorry about working so many years where people told me what to paint because it was, it was more of that. It was like this exercise of, well, maybe you don't have all the ingredients you'd like. Then it's like, how do you make it work? And the more you can challenge yourself, the more, um, I don't know, the, the faster you're going to be able to figure things out. And I mean, that's what it all is, right? It's a puzzle. Yeah. Well, you the feel thing like there's, like, oh, go ahead, Chris. Oh, um, I was going to say, do you feel like there's value? I mean, maybe not, you know, for someone at your level, but for people in general doing works for works for hire where you, you know, have, you had this long stint of not having a choice and just being able to not worry about your ideas, but instead just try to implement someone else's ideas as best you can. Do you think that's a valuable thing for? I think that's incredibly valuable. And I think that's like some of the best artists that I know didn't start out just having the freedom to do whatever they wanted. A lot of them started out. I mean, I th I'm thinking of like Peter Ferguson is one of my favorite artists at all. He, he's a Canadian artist. Um, Chris Lieb is another one. Um, I can think of so many artists who had their start not being able to just be like these famous painters. They started out putting their time in working for other people and um, having to do work under whatever constraints they were given. And I would, I mean, and then you look back at like the way um, master shops used to run back in um when there were apprenticeships and there were masters and apprentices and things like that, you would, you wouldn't even be allowed to like do anything but fruit for like five years. And that was only after you'd just drawn for two and then they let you have a paintbrush. Like, and well, you had I think there's a lot of things to do. Let's not forget no, that. No, I know. And then like, yeah, you, you were that guy before, yeah. like you got to use the paint and like, no, I think that um, this is a really weird time because now we have social media where everybody starting out is already posting and establishing their first year work. And 
people are really constrained to like, this is who I am. This is what I do. And it's all up online and it's all permanent, but paintings and, you know, it's, it's, it's a craft that takes a minute to learn and, and kind of know where your voice is and things like that. And I, I don't think that, I'm not saying in every situation, but I think a lot of the time that doesn't come instantly. I think that that it, it, it's beyond valuable. And that's, you know, that's why even, um, you know, there's there's graduate programs and there's all these things before they used to recommend that you would even show. Like you need to find your voice first before you can, you know, use it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I agree with that, Jill, because another thing and just, you know, talking once again about what you guys are doing with the secret gallery is that you're exhibiting working artists, you know, individuals that have gotten to an area of style and content and technique that they arrived at from years and years and years and years of developing their voice and who they are and that who they are and where they are now is what is informing what they're doing. And, you know, the thing that I find missing with, like you say, younger, I'll say kids, I don't mean that derogatorily, but, you know, kids is that you can't, your, your work can't be informed if you haven't lived, you know, that's, and so it's, it's one of the things I think that's so really, really important is to, you know, to be informed in ways that are beyond about just making art, you know, just about, you know, getting out of school and having your degree or, or not getting out of school or whatever it is. And I just think that, that one of the things about really social media platforms and the instantaneousness of it is that it dilutes the power of an, of an evolution of an artist. I'm not one that likes art about art. I don't like movies yeah, about I movies. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Oh my gosh, you too. And thanks again to to both of you for, for everything you do. And I really can't wait to see your show. It's going to be so much fun. Ah, oh, thanks, Philip. I can't wait to thanks, see you. Thanks, Philip. Okay, so um okay, so when we do whatever we're doing next, it says and just as an aside here, man, Chris, I love doing this. This is so it's so much fun. Just a bunch of people sitting around yeah, chewing. Totally. Apart. It's just so much fun. You know, it's like going yeah, to the well, garden and having a beer and you're just talking about art. <laughs> well, we're really enjoying it too. And uh next week we're gonna be talking with Morrison Pierce. Oh, fun. And uh Morrison and Jill have some works in our current show, uh, Is That Your Horse? And then they'll also have works in our new show, which is opening on Saturday here at the Secret Gallery, called And the Horse You Rode In On. Okay, so the show that opens Saturday. It's a part so two. It's a, it's a sequel to the first show. Okay. It's, and, is that your horse? Part how, two. how are you getting around? Or are you, I mean, in terms of getting around the social distancing thing, I mean, what do you, how <laughs> that's do, what we do. We rearranged our schedule. So what we did was instead of introducing the show that we were going to have for the next two months, we've got all the same artists from this show and we're going to continue with our um, walkthroughs. It's been a really popular show. So we're going to keep it up online but it'll be part two. So the same artists will be doing continuations of the theme. And oh, great. we've got a and couple new ones too, new artists. Yeah. Okay. And we're also, we're also going to be doing a, a by appointment only opening on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. I'm making an so appointment. So we'll be opening up on our website <laughs> uh, at okay. www.thesecret.gallery yeah. where you can go and make an appointment to come to our opening and we'll give you wine and cheese and we'll sanitize your hands and show you the art. Sounds good. In so I'm going to make it a 30 minute uh, sessions and I'll, and I'll bring you it to two to four people. Okay. So I, I'm going to make an appointment and I'll bring you a truffle. What do you think about that? <laughs> that quite fun? Heck yeah. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> yeah. We love truffles at the secret gallery. <laughs> okay, good. Well, once again, it's been a pleasure, and I will see you guys. Uh, what day of the week is this Monday? I'll see you uh, Saturday or Sunday then. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, bye. Thanks, Philip. <laughs>